Well, I, um, I've never had an introduction like that, and I don't deserve that, but, uh, I almost feel like if I go cry a few minutes, I'd come back and do all right. Now, bear with me. Truly, the Lord has, uh, has blessed me. Amen. Uh, I, uh, I kind of believe that you learn more from the things that you suffer than you ever learn from your pleasures. You don't learn very much from your pleasures. Um, I think about Jacob when he had that vision of the ladder reaching from heaven to earth. He was in flight from the wrath of his brother all alone on a rocky ground in the, in the still of the night. God taught him some things. I think about many of the Psalms that were written by David were written when he was being pursued by the king that he uh, honored. He did honor that king. His life was uh, in jeopardy. The revelations were written by John when he was exiled on a rock island all alone for the word of God. So I have to thank God for everything. Things that bring sorrow as well as things that bring joy. It's all in the network of life. Don't think you're going to go through life and block one of them out. You won't do it. It's a dream. Um, so I have to thank God for the things that I've suffered and, uh, and ask God for his will. Well, I'm glad to be here. I'm here by choice. I'm here because I'm striving to serve the Lord with uh, limited knowledge. But what little bit of knowledge God gives you, then he requires that of you. I don't think he's going to judge you for not having something he never gave you to start with. But once he gives it to you, then you're accountable for it. Uh, I, too, like Sister Lily, am impressed with these young people. I think about the in the Acts of the Apostles, the Scripture said the Lord added daily to the church such as should be saved. And God has chosen to add to our church a wonderful group of young people that are inspiring to me when I look at their countenance. And uh, when, I, when I recognize in all of its fullness the reality of the wages of sin, and I believe that this course that they've taken is an escape is a way around that. Uh, I see people on the job that I work with. I see people in restaurants. I see people in various places that I go that are absolutely spiritually bankrupt. They have nothing, nothing to draw on. Their minds, their intents, their avenues in life, their course in life is worldly, is of the world, is of the flesh, and as the brother said, is a dead end. And it destroys them. And I'm not talking about one or two, or I'm talking about tens of thousands and thousands of thousands all over our country. For all the things that are right in America, there are some things that are dreadfully wrong. Our prisons are bursting at the seams. Morally bankrupt, many people are. Have no knowledge of God. Have no fear of God. Live their lives that way. And then come to the end and have nothing to draw on. It's sad. But I think about these young people and I, I to a degree, would like to address them and, and perhaps maybe others. Pardon me. <clears throat> Ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians. Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain we normally think of races as where one person enters or one person wins. There's 
many, many kinds of races. And coincidentally, today, the whole city of Atlanta is kind of, <laughs> they're kind of hyped up about them being the, holding that position. But I'm, I would like to, to talk today about a race where there are many participants. I'm sure that you may remember in your school days, I certainly do in mine, where we had relay races. And everybody was a participant. Whether you was weak or whether you was fast or slow, it didn't seem to matter. The criteria was that everybody be included. And so you ran just a little segment of the race. Uh, if there was one thing that went through from start to finish, just it was, I don't know what the proper word for that is, we just used a stick. We just had a stick that we handed off from one to the other. But uh, everybody participated. I like that. I am very fond of that concept that everybody participates. When Moses made demands on Pharaoh about his people going, Pharaoh says, well, who's going to go? Pharaoh had in mind just maybe two or three or maybe a few, Moses says, we're all going. Our young ones, our old ones, our sons, our daughters, our cattle, our herds, they're not going to be a hoof left over. Everybody's going. I like that. I really desire everybody to go. God has made a way that we all can go. If you don't go, We want to help you to go. Start to say it's your own fault. I don't, I don't want to say that. Uh, know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that you may obtain. Now, I think that we, as we run our race, and as not necessarily in a race where one starts and, and finishes, but in this, in this relay race where everybody's involved, where our forebears were involved, where our children are involved, when everybody has a part, there probably will come one particular time in your life where the stick will be handed to you. Perhaps not in a great way, maybe that everybody recognizes. It may not be that you're a great leader or a great influential person, but in some capacity, be it only in your family, be it in your crowd, in your local congregation where you live, sometime in your life, the burden and the weight of carrying this gospel along will be placed on your shoulders. The stick will be given to you. Somebody will hand it off, and it'll be your job to carry on. And to these young people today, prepare yourself. Prepare yourself for that time when you can take the mantle, when you can take the scepter, when you can take the burden of the weight of the gospel and move on with it with respect to those who have carried the banner ahead of you, with, uh, with respect to those who will come along behind you, run with objective, run with patience, uh, have your goal set, know where you're going, know what it's all about, know what the light of the gospel is, know what the Spirit of Christ is, know what the attitudes that you should have Know what it is and run and run with patience and run diligently. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. We're not just going off in every different direction. God help us. We're all participants. We're all many members of this body. But we're in one race. We are in one race. We know where we're going. And we want everybody to have a part in running this race. Everybody. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Many times I've wondered exactly what that verse meant. 
<coughs> I read where a very famous man, I hesitate to use his name, but I'm going to because he's the one who said it. Albert Einstein said, I'm not interested in being right as much as I am interested in knowing whether I am right. Now that might sound at first blush like you're splitting hairs and it doesn't have a lot of meaning. They seem like they're so near each other and so uh, parallel that there's not much difference. There is a vast difference. If you'll bear with me a minute. Um, sometimes people discover the truth and they, they come properly and they understand at that discovery that it's not of them. They are nothing. They have just found something that is something. They have found the truth. They have found the right. And then sometimes over a course of years, there is a gradual shift that takes place. And they begin to think not that right is right or truth is truth, but they begin to think that I Einstein said, I'm not interested in being right as much as in knowing whether I am right. I keep under my body. If you got the emphasis on yourself and God ever chastened you for something or perhaps you ever discovered an error This attitude that you are right, my mind, my thoughts, my reputation, my attitudes, my spirit, all of it has to be in subjection to the truth. It has to be. It'd be a sad thing if we ever made that shift that slow and gradual shift to where we thought we were right. We may be. We may be right, but it's not of us. Right is of itself. Truth is of itself. You may even think sometimes that you are going to be instrumental in holding up the truth. No. The truth stands on its own. It's on a firm foundation. We may fail. Every person in this building may fail. It does not damage God's truth whatsoever. The truth is not built on us. We are built on the truth. Okay, back to the race. The, uh, the relay race think something about perhaps the Olympics. I'm not sure. They carry a torch. Don't know much about that, but I got some idea that they carry a torch, and perhaps different ones carry it at different times, but they keep the light burning, don't they? They keep the fire burning. I feel very appreciative of those who are in this building today, and those who have gone on before, and those who are in other places, who have kept the lights burning, have been diligent enough about serving God, about searching for the truth, about uh, delving into the Word of God, about observing life and all that it means, and bringing it all into subjection to God's Word, and kept the fire of the Holy Ghost burning, I thank God for them. We owe them much. I thank God for my contemporaries, my brothers and sisters who are my age or thereabout, who may today be carrying that light. Not one, many, all of us carrying the light. There's one light now. There's only one light. But we all can carry a part of it. Perhaps we have only a candle, and maybe it has very small candle power, but keep it burning. Keep it burning. I believe 
It was said of Jesus that a bruised reed he would not break, and a smoking flax he would not quench. I think that there is in the medical profession a, a oath or a creed or something that they have to uh, observe, and it's called the Hippocratic Oath. And I don't know exactly what all it says, but what I think it means is if you can't help your patient, don't hurt him. Um, and so if I can't do anything to help you today, I, God forbid I do anything to hurt you. Come a time, many times in the Bible, where the scepter, the torch, the stick had to be passed from one to another. We have some examples about it. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days, so the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended and the stick was given. The torch was passed. And Joshua, the son of Nun, full of the spirit of wisdom, for Mo Moses has laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And uh, I know my time is getting away. But it said unto Joshua, There shall not be a man able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Moses had a different job from Joshua. They were carrying the same torch. They were administering to the same God. They were answering the same purpose, but they had different jobs to do. Moses led his people out. He led them across the Red Sea. He led them through the great and terrible wilderness of three days' journeys, and they stood, stayed 40 years. It seems to me like the law of averages would have broke them out somewhere, three days for 40 years. But there come a time that the thing had to be passed from one to the other, and Joshua was there. Now listen, Joshua wasn't running around playing all over the wilderness prior to this time. And I remember when, I, when we had those relays at school, you had to, when it was coming around for your time to take it, you had to have some concentration. You had to be watching your forerunner. You had to be ready. You had to be geared. You had to know where you were going. It took some attention. It took some... It took some uh, concentration to be ready to, to grasp that thing and to go with it and you ran and you ran with all you had for a little while and then you handed it to someone else that's the way life is that's the way life is God help us our generation to appreciate those that have carried it before us to continue to carry it some of us it's about ready to about time to pass it off about ready to give it on to someone else and you young people I say to you be interested in the race. Prepare yourself. If you just have to stand there and run in place for a while, do your exercises. Know where the stick is. Know when it's coming around. Know when the truth, know what it is. Know where it is. Know how to decipher that. There's, I can't tell you that this is going to be just some little short-circuited thing that you're going to do and then it's all over with. It's going to take some preparation for you. It's going to take some effort in your life. I can't tell you that there won't be uh, battles to fight, that there won't be things to suffer, that there won't be uh, mysteries to solve, that there won't be things to work yourself through, work your way through, and begin to recognize that everything that glitters is not gold. Everything that appears to be one way is not always that way. Even in our family lives, we have people in our families sometimes who have a brusque, rough, uh, coarse uh, disposition on the surface and then deep down underneath that they're just as gentle and just as kind and as tender hearted as they can be they don't appear to be that way but they are that way and I can tell you in the race of life that you'll find some of that there are people I'm sure that you've known that appear to be very wealthy drove big fine automobiles and had all the trappings of wealth but you found out later they didn't they weren't qualified for that. That's life. Things are not always what they seem to be. 
And I'm not telling you that you can take everything. When you're running this race at face value, you can't. You're, it's going to take some work. It's going to take some study. It's going to take some observation. It's going to take some reading of the Word of God. It's going to take some prayers. It's going to take some confrontations with you and your own convictions, with you and your truth. You can't be a politician and serve the Lord. Politicians take, take a poll of how is my vote going to affect this group and that group and how is it going to affect me? And, and what path do I take so me rises a little higher? You can't serve God on that concept. Anyway, that was Moses and Joshua. Joshua took that charge. He took the stick. He run with it. He hearkened. First book of the Kings. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and shew thyself a man. Pass on the mantle, isn't it? He's handing him the stick. It's all over for me, son. It's time for you to take it and move on with it. Somewhere in our life we reach that point. It may not be a particular time. It may not be a particular day or an hour. But sometime we will have run our course. As the Apostle Paul said, I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I have fought a good fight. I think he was talking to Timothy, his son, and he was exhorting him to be strong and of a good courage and to take up the mantle, the truth of the gospel, the word of life, and go with it. I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and shew thyself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, whithersoever thou turnest thyself. And the Lord may continue his word, which he spake unto thee, saying, If thy children... It ha this has to do with our fathers, with us, and our children. It's comprehensive. You can't draw a circle around yourself. You can't close yourself in a room or a box and say it doesn't matter what happened or it doesn't matter what's going to happen. We're, our lives are interrelated. So run your race. When it's placed on your shoulders, do your job. Do it well. If thy children take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart, with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man, on the throne of Israel. Do you remember? I won't take time to read it. Solomon reached a time that God prospered him, and he wrote the uh, Proverbs. Solomon wrote the Proverbs. Do you remember about the first five or six chapters in Proverbs? My son, if thou wilt hearken, my son, if thou wilt keep the commandments, my son. Perhaps he was talking, Solomon had many sons, David did too. Perhaps he was talking to Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the son of Solomon that was to take the kingdom. He was the rightful heir to the kingdom. I always had trouble remembering which was which between Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and I, and I solved it one day, and I said, Rehoboam, starting with an R, was the rightful heir, and Jeroboam, starting with a J, was the jealous one. So I got that straight. Rehoboam was the rightful heir to the throne. But when the scepter was given to Rehoboam, he didn't do well. The people of the land came to Rehoboam and said, Make our burdens lighter. And Rehoboam said, My little finger will be thicker than my father's thigh. He chastised you with whips. I'll chastise you with scorpions. The old men told him, said, if you will be kind to these people, they will be your servants forever. You know, a good, kind spirit will, be, will do a lot for you. It will help you in life. It will carry you a long ways, a kindness, a good, sweet spirit to want to work with people is of utmost value, but Rehoboam didn't do it. 
And I want to tell you the consequences of that one man failing to take the scepter in the spirit of his father caused ten tribes to revolt against the house of Judah. And they went over to Samaria and they established their kingdom over there. And the, the house of Judah was ready to go fight them. They were ready to go bring them back in subjection. They didn't care for them defecting over there like that. But the Lord stopped them in that. And I don't understand all this, but the Lord told them, said, that answer was for me. I hate to think that God was responsible for causing that division, but, and y'all can, I mean, there it is. Think what you want. But I will say this. That division was there for years and years and years. And it was never brought back into any form of unison until Christ came. And he, we sang the song a while ago about the woman at the well. She was a Samaritan woman. There were ten lepers cleansed. One of them turned back to give thanks to his master. That one was a Samaritan. There was a man of the house of Judah who fell among thieves and was robbed and beaten and left half dead. And the pious men of the day and the men of the cloth passed by on the other side. But one man with compassion with kindness in his heart, with the love for his fellow man, administered to him, that man was a Samaritan. And I think today, I don't know why that house was divided. I don't know why it was of the Lord. I don't know the answers to many questions, but oh, I long for that spirit of Christ to cross lines and to heal, to bind to instruct us that the most important thing we have to do in our life is to serve the Lord. Picking up too much time, eh? <clears throat> Another example of here when the, when the scepter was passed. Came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elisha went with Elijah from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. You know where Bethel was? It's where Jacob dreamed his dream. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel, and the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will be taken away, that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. I don't suppose it was a very pleasant thing for him to think about. His master was going to be taken away from him that day. He was re getting ready to pass the stick, wasn't he? He was getting ready to hand him the torch. I fought a good fight. I've done my best. Son, you take it and go on with it. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. He's just going all over the place. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho, and the sons of the prophet that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee. For the Lord has sent me to Jordan. He's went now from Bethel to Jericho to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. I think there's something here for us, for you as younger people, to recognize that you need to keep in sight of those who have gone on before you. Don't think that you can go off your separate ways all alone in an unknown world and have the security that you've got here. Don't think that. If there's faults in our house, help us correct those faults. Don't run away. We don't want you to go away. 
We want you here. You're our sons. You're our daughters. You've been raised here. We have a claim on you. We're not saying that there are not other churches. There may be a thousand. There may be ten thousand. But this is your house. This is where you belong. And we need your help. Okay. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets were went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. It came to pass, and when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I will do for thee before I be taken away. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be unto me. What a pristine desire. What a wonderful desire he had. He never asked for the honor that Elijah had among the people. He never asked for any wealth. Had Elijah had any, I don't know. I doubt that he did. But he asked for a double portion of his spirit. And that's what I desire from those who have gone before me is a double spirit of the kindness and the sincerity with which they serve the Lord. And it came to pass as they went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that, behold, I, I, excuse me, and Elijah, Elijah saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. And he went back and he stood by the banks of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and he smote the waters. And he said, Where is the God of Elijah? And when he had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither. And Elisha went over. I want to tell you, if you get a hold of this, if you get a hold of this mantle, if you get a hold of this scepter, if you get a hold of this torch, if you take this stick and go with it, it will work. It will do for you what it has done for our forebears. It will give you joy and peace and happiness. It will light your way, as the dear sister that talked at the first of the meeting very up in years, uh, still finds the joy of the Lord the most sustaining thing in her life. How many people her age languish away in homes of their own or in other kinds of homes do not have that comforting, sweet Spirit of God to sustain them, and we're telling you that this is it. This is it. Seek for it. Search for it. Know where the mantle is. Know when it's coming around. Know when it's your time. Be ready to grasp a hold. To be ready to run with all that you've got to, because there's coming a day that you'll pass it off to another. And the fact that this light still burns is important. It's important to us. So the relay race has only one light, has only one gospel, but everybody has a part. You believe that? We are the participants in this race. There's no condition, there's no amount of handicap that you may have that you cannot be a part of this. If you prepare yourself, if you search for it, if you seek for it, if you're willing to grasp a holt and go with it, God will bless you. I really appreciate the few minutes I've had with you. I'd like to say that uh, your hospitality is great. We, uh, on behalf of all the visitors that are here, a special thanks to the ladies and the men who, who work so hard. We know what it's like. It's a lot of effort, a lot of work. But I really do believe that our feast meetings and our joining ourselves together in fellowship has more reward than can be put into words. Holding us together as one people, as one body, binding us together, learning more about your brothers and sisters, learning how to understand various situations in life perhaps that you may not have understood previously. I believe it's of the Lord. 
and I desire to participate. I want to be a part of it. I want to uh, carry this torch as best I can, and I want, I want these young people to prepare themselves because the day is coming. It may be nearer than you think. I ask you to pray for me.